I'm Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview. On today's show, I'll talk to writer John Kenneth Muir, author of The X-Files, FAQ, all that's left to know about global conspiracy, aliens, Lazarus species, and monsters of the week. Is this book legit? Well, let's just say that the show's creator, Chris Carter, wrote the foreword. Stick around. Who's ready for a post-Californication dose of spooky Mulder? When my future wife and I started living together, the first appointment TV series in our lives was ABC's daytime soap, All My Children. It was her addiction, not mine, but it was kind of silly fun. Now, we always watch TV together after work, as we do even now, and the next series I remember us committing to in the 1990s was Fox's long-running bit of alien abduction weirdness, The X-Files. We watched every episode with bated breath, sometimes amused and awed, sometimes left scratching our heads in total confusion. But, and this is important, we were always eager for the next installment. We watched all nine seasons together, worrying about Mulder's porn addiction, his sister Samantha's abduction, Scully's pregnancy, and Smoking Man's ever-impending impo- doom. We even watched the spin-off series Millennium and the Lone Gunman, and the first feature film Fight the Future. Uh, honestly, we never did get around to the second, I want to believe. The first one didn't really knock us out, off our yeah. chairs. Oh, and we also followed Fo- Fox Mulder. <coughs> I'm sorry, I mean actor David Duchovny through his uncomfortably pornographic Showtime series, Californication, wondering when Dana Scully, I'm sorry, I mean actress Gillian Anderson, would star in the ultimate seductive story arc. Still waiting for that. Yeah. And now The X-Files is returning to the small screen for a 2016 limited series that creator Chris Carter promises fans promises will give fans everything we loved about the original and more. Now, who better to prepare us for the show's return than John Kenneth Muir, author of The X-Files FAQ, all that's left to know about global conspiracy, aliens, Lazarus species, and monsters of the week. John Kenneth Muir, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you, Bob, very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm just sorry that I didn't include in my subtitle and Mulder's porn collection. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not too late to go back and get it ready for the second edition because, you know, people who watch the show know how devoted he was to that. Absolutely. We, we know he, how he's going to die from one episode, <laughs> what uh, autoerotic asphyxiation, right? That's ultimately his demise will arise from that. That will probably be his demise in every series he's ever in. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, all right, so let's uh, – and, and, and for, for people watching who are, seeing, who are looking at the background, we'll get to that. Just okay. trust me, we'll get to that. Uh, we actually – we started this interview 20 minutes late because I was so fascinated with all the great <laughs> toys behind John. We'll get to that, I promise. Um, so let's assume there are some people watching who never quite got the appeal of the original X-Files but are actually giving consideration to watching its return right. in 2016. Can you kind of provide the uh, the Evelyn Wood uh, version of what made the show compelling TV for so many years? Well, there are actually a number of different fronts, I think, that made the X-Files so compelling. Firstly, you had these two characters who were so different, Mulder and Scully, and they each sort of uh, represent a worldview, whether it's belief or skepticism. And that's really interesting to see these, you know, to have this... Um, it's sort of like glasses. You know, every week you put on these glasses and you see through the character's eyes and you think, am I a Mulder uh, or am I a Scully or am I some combination thereof? Um, and I think people love to look at the world that way. And, you know, every week um, they brought up these mysteries. There was, there was one episode about the Loch Ness Monster, many episodes about UFOs, but they didn't even limit it just to what you'd say is like traditional paranormal things like near-death experiences or astral projection. I mean, they also talked about religion. They talked about faith. Um, and you know, just in general, what is belief? And I think that really connected with people. Um, so I think it wasn't just intelligent writing, and the writing was extremely intelligent. It wasn't just the fact that horror movies in the 90s were unusually bad and the X-Files was unusually good. Um, it was that we were being led in, in this journey, this very cinematic journey over several seasons, uh, asking ourselves, 
do we believe this? Can we believe this? Should we believe this? You know, is, is, is this nonsense or is this part of what it means to be human, to look through a different set of eyes and at the mysteries, you know, of the universe? So I, th- I think that's really what made the show so appealing. I, I, I was going to ask you this later, but you brought it up. You talked about how good the series actually was. And I, I wanted to ask you, um, how does this show uh, hold up by today's standards of uh, The Wire or The Sopranos and, and Breaking Bad? Is it in that pantheon, uh, considering you know there's a gener- almost a generation apart? That is a great question. You know, I watched uh, pretty much the whole series again when I was uh, prepping this book. And I found that it really does hold up well. What may tend to take peop- some people out of it is, um, you know, the the model cars, <laughs> the uh, maybe some of the haircuts, uh, some of the fashions. You know, all the typical things of understanding that you know this was from 1993, so we're we're well past that in terms of our fashion taste, in terms of our technology. You know, their 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 cell phones, things like that. No iPhones. So there are some things that make you stop and say, okay, we're looking at something from. A while back here, but as far as how the show looks, Chris Carter and his directors did something amazing, which was that they shot every episode virtually as a mini movie, and so the series is really built visually on you know these strong tenets of filmmaking you look you look at the shots they use, the compositions they use, and it 's like watching you know a horror movie every week and in that sense, in terms of the writing in terms of the characters, but really in terms of the visualization. I mean, the show just holds up beautifully. Um, you know, I think you could really say that The X-Files was a show that began that pantheon, in a sense. Um, you know, The X-Files is a little bit of a hybrid, as I think some reviewer pointed out, which is kind of funny since the show concerns, you know, human-alien hybrids. But it's a hybrid in the sense that you have the standalone episodes and then you have the myth arc episodes. And today, a show like Breaking Bad or The Wire or some such thing, they can pretty much dispense with the standalone shows and just go myth arc, go, you know, go through the whole serialized, novelized approach to storytelling. The X-Files would give you more of a breath, so to speak. It's like, okay, so we've done you know, two weeks of this myth arc, and now we're going to give you, you know, two or three weeks of the standalone Monster of the Week stories, and then we'll go back to the myth arc. Now, today, that approach um, maybe is not so in vogue. I actually think it works rather nicely because, um, I mean, I love The Walking Dead and I love The Wire and Breaking Bad and all that. But there's something nice about the X-Files that occasionally um, you can take a breath. It's like, oh, I'm going to take a breath this week and just get a standalone story. It relaxes your mind a little bit. And you say, okay, and I'll be back, you know, in two weeks to pick up from where we left off. Um, I think that the X-Files is really good at doing that, that – You know, this combination approach is really nice because I do think some people have turned off the serialized approach a bit now. It's like, you know, originally TV was very standalone. You think about Lost in Space, Star Trek, things like that. You know, and then we moved into the era full on of 24, Breaking Bad, The Wire, stuff like that. And I know some people were getting really burned out on that. So the hybrid approach is kind of nice because you get a little bit of both. <laughs> you know, as soon as you're tired of one, you're in the other, and then when you're finished with that, you go back to the other. You know, I, you know if you're binge watching the X Files, uh, it's great to it's like, okay, you know, I only have an hour tonight, so let me just watch a standalone. You know, as opposed to having three hours of myth arc. Well, and I, it's exactly what I wanted to ask you about next is you did. I'm assuming you rewatched every episode. I you did. Have to, right? So, absolutely. How long could you go continuously watching episodes? Uh, and, you know, what was the what was the length, the longest uh, binge uh, in, in preparation for writing the book? Um, be, because of the sort of specifics of my life at this point, I'm married. I'm you know holding down a job, and I have a kid. I couldn't do as much binge watching as I want. So it's like I, I couldn't just do a run like I could have done in my 20s where it would be like, I'll do, you know, 20 hours at a clip, <laughs> you know. But um, I think the longest I did was an eight-hour clip. and or eight, I should say eight-episode clip because, of course, once you take commercials out, it's a little under an hour. Um, and, and that was wonderful. I mean, I, I love getting immersed in Chris Carter's world. There's something about the way – um, the dialogue functions. Um, he's wonderful with voiceovers. I know some some critics don't particularly like voiceovers. I love the voiceovers on the X Files. I love when 
Mulder or Scully talk to us in their voice, telling us how they show the world. And I can just get lost in that voice. So I, um, even though I didn't have the opportunity to really go crazy, uh, and, and I had to sort of say, okay, this is the time I'm setting aside to watch the X Files, maybe two or three a night, typically. Um, it, it was still immersive enough. I couldn't wait to get to it. You know, it was, <laughs> it's, oh, uh, you know, I, I'm getting to the peacocks tonight. You know, <laughs> to the the crazy inbred folks. You know, <laughs> right? that kind of stuff. Now there is a chapter of the book for every season, and you summarize all the episodes. Uh, do you did you create your own summaries? Did you rely on the the network summaries? How do you, how do you do that? Because and you know I'm I'm thinking too. You only want to watch it once. <laughs> <laughs> With this many, it was nine seasons plus right. movies. You know, for me though, the thing is this, and you know, I've always said my goal in life is to make a living watching TV. I've only been quasi successful. I've made sort of a mild living watching TV, but I want to watch the X Files or Millennium or Star Trek. I love to watch them over and over again because. I feel like the more times you watch it, the more times you see something. I mean, the more new things you see. And I feel like, you know, I might miss something after only three viewings, and then I can make a connection on the fifth viewing, which sounds really crazy, and it drives my wife insane sometimes. But it's, I, I feel like it's true. You know, when we typically watch a movie, I think the statistic is something like you only pick up 80% of it. You, know, you only percent, pick up 80% of what the creators are putting out to you. Now, imagine you know, a TV show and there's, you know, all these different episodes and they're interconnected. So, you know, you do have to watch them more than once. But to answer the question specifically is that I write all the summaries. I take extensive notes <laughs> while I'm watching the shows and I I take notes sort of in categories in a sense. Like, okay, this episode is giving me um, a thread about Scully's faith or uh, about Mulder's porn or something like that. And so then at some point, like when I'm writing up the chapters or trying to make connections on themes or things like that, I can say, okay, you know, we have this whole faith theme running through the series. And, um, you know, then I, so then I can do a chapter on religion and how the X-Files looks at religion and things like that. So I take extensive notes. I have, you know, I, I'm sure someone would look at my chicken scratch say, oh, you know, he's a serial killer or something. But I have these, I have these, you know, these notebooks filled with, you know, X-Files summaries and things like that, <laughs> which I then go back to and refer. Now, if I were better organized, um, you know, I would, ha- I would have all the pages in order. I didn't always go strictly in order. Sometimes an episode, I'd say, okay, that's like setting up something. And before I lose that thread, let me leap over here and see – if the punctuation of that thread, you know, if, if they tie that thread. Um, so, but then I found out as I was writing that that wasn't really the, I really probably should have just gone in order, right? You know, just stuck in, uh, you know, traditional order because then I, I'd always know exactly where my notes were for the particular episode. If that makes sense. Well, when you do the Californication FAQ, <laughs> go in order. That would be my advice. I love Californication. Yeah. I think it's a great show. I was so sad to see it go, you know, I I absolutely adore the character of Mulder, obviously. I mean, he's fantastic. I never thought I would see David Duchovny, especially so soon after the X-Files, right. get immersed in a role that I loved just as much. I mean, Hank Moody, amazing. I mean, I think, wow. You know, I, I, I wonder if it was going to be one of those things like a little bit – I mean, I love William Shatner and Adam West. But it's like going to be one of those things where we're always going to say, I only see Mulder. You know, I only see Kirk. I only see Bruce Wayne. Yeah. You know, it's amazing that in Californication, it's like at some point, you're like, no, I'm not seeing Mulder. I'm seeing Hank Moody. Well, uh, ex- okay, except, <laughs> I mean, Mulder and Moody both had a lot of similar issues. They do. They you do. Know? And so for me, it was just like, it was like uh, the friend spin off Joey. I mean, it was just, you know, <laughs> or, 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 well, let me, let me think about that again. It was, uh, it was the opposite of when Lou Grant left Mary Tyler Moore. And did Lou Grant. He went from a comedy to a drama. Right. This is kind of the, the inverse of that, where Lou Grant would have gone from a drama to a comedy. Right. The inverse, yeah, right. The inverse. I mean, it's, yes, it's, absolutely. And I had, uh, oh, I can't think of the, the, the young lady's name. The actress from the first season uh, who was, became the author of uh, Punching. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that one. I, I won't use the word because I think this show may draw in some younger uh, audiences. <laughs> but I had her on, and uh, I mean, it was just th- that first episode where they have their encounter, and it sets the whole series in. in I mean, yeah. it was insane. <laughs> it, it was, was just totally insane. It was. Oh I remember God. I got a screener from that uh, 
you know, that first episode, and I put it in, I thought, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this was back in, I guess, 2006, something yeah. like that. I, got a, I said to my wife, I said, you have to watch this with me. This is like, wow. They, they, from the first scene, I mean, what, the first scene was like this extremely sacrilegious uh, scene in a church, like with a nun. and right. hmm. But it was hysterically funny. That was great. I, I loved it. I, I thought it was a great show. It was another show that we, I mean, we watched it religiously. Around somewhere in the middle of it, we were starting to say, maybe maybe we should let go of this one. It just doesn't, you know, there, there's no, it's not like we, we needed Hank to, to, we needed his redemption. Right. But it just kept going. It was a little too circular for, for a while. That's why I kept hoping that the series was going to end with uh, Gillian Anderson being the final, <laughs> the final arc. I thought, oh, this would be so great. And then especially now in retrospect that he's following that with a return to the X-Files. Right, uh, right. Anyway, I'm sorry. I got, I got us off track here. No, not at all because I love California. And, you know, it ne- I guess it never got tiring for me because it, it always, there weren't that many episodes a season. So it was like – I would watch it, and then I would go like six months before I watched it. I, I always watched it like a binge, you know, the, the Californication. They were a half hour, so it was easy to like to really, you know, digest a bunch of those at a time. So I'd be like, oh, well, was, oh, we finished in two weeks. And then it would be like six months before we got the next season. And I was like, okay, here we go. We're good. So no, it was love fun. it. All right, let's come back to this book and this series. Um, one of the chapters in uh, the X-Files FAQ is, do you remember the one where – which right. sounds like you're talking about Friends episodes. I hate to say <laughs> Friends again because they were always they were always titled the one where you right. Know, uh, right Joey fell off the the the, the Empire State Building. <laughs> I hope you caught that one. Um, anyway, uh, it's a compendium of 25 landmark moments in the show. Right. Was it was it hard having watched all the episodes to narrow it down to 25, or was it hard to get it to 25? You know, it wasn't difficult, I guess, because I. I've been an X Files fan for so long, and I took the journey with the show as it aired. And at that point, I was in my twenties, and I had a lot of time on my hands. Sort of un- unlike now, where you know I'm raising a kid and you know doing a job. <laughs> Back then, I was like, I, you know, I'm going to get every magazine about the X Files. You know, I'm going to watch every episode over and over again, uh, all that kind of stuff. So I was like. I was really there for the journey. So I was like, I was one of those fans who's like, like, when is the first kiss going to be? You know, when are they going to resolve, you know, this particular mystery in the, um, the myth arc? Uh, when are they going to bring in, you know, this character or how are they going to finish this off? So I feel like I have this kind of, I don't know, chronology or timeline in my head from the 90s, which is a weird thing to say, but I often – consider myself like a historian, even though I write about like the X-Files and Star Trek and Space 1999, I have like this kind of running history in my head, you know? And so I remember those things. Like I, I remember the thrill of the first movie and they're going to kiss. And then of course she gets stung by a bee, you know, with the, with the uh, virus in it, you know? So it was like, man, I kind of, that chapter was actually easy to write because in my head, I was thinking as a fan, what were the things that really struck me? You know, watching it, taking this journey with the show. So I just kind of had to resurrect my younger self from you know the 1990s. How uh, I was impressed uh, that I mean uh, Chris Carter, who created the series, uh, wrote the forward. How did that come about? Um, Chris Carter is a great guy. I mean, he's not only an incredibly talented writer, but I think he's very encouraging to fans. I think his work lends itself to participation by creative people you know you look at people involved with millennium x files and these are people who are artists they create videos they create paintings they create books you know they they take his work and you know they they create art from his art and we um I guess how I I'm trying to think back how I first got in touch with Chris Chris Carter I think what happened was after the second movie um, I want to believe in 2008. I, I wrote a review of it on my blog, and it was a positive review because I love I loved I loved the film. I mean, critics hated it, um, and I didn't. I loved it. I thought it was great, and I thought I made a good argument why it was good. I, mean, I hope I did. And I think I believe after that, Chris Carter contacted me to say thank you for the review, and me being the opportunist was like. You want to do an interview, <laughs> you know, for my blog, <laughs> and and he very graciously agreed to do that, and you know, we had a long talk, um, I guess sometime in two thousand and nine um, about the X Files, Millennium, Harsh Realm, you know, the second feature film, uh, X Files, things like that, and 
um, you know, I just always write about his stuff, and I know he read, he he at, at some point was reading my blog. I don't know that he, he reads my blog regularly or does now, but I know at some point he did. And I, I mean, I wrote about the after and things like that, and I asked him because I think he has a really good sense of horror to write the foreword for my book Horror Films FAQ, which is the same publisher, but it was 2013, the book before this. And um, he wrote a beautiful foreword talking about his love for um, Creature from the Black Lagoon and how the Fluke Man is kind of the Creature from the Black Lagoon and the X-Files. I mean, just, just a really beautiful foreword. I mean, just launched that book in you know great style. Um, but at that point, you know, my publisher was looking for another book and I thought – I said, you know, the only – other book of this size that I want to do right now would be the X-Files. I really want to write about the X-Files. I love the X-Files. It's a passion for me. I don't want to write, I don't want to spend a year of my life writing about something I'm lukewarm on or don't really like. Um, so I wanted to do X-Files and they said yes. And I was like, okay, so I'm going to go back to Chris Carter and ask. And he was a, just an extreme gentleman. I mean, such a nice guy because when he wrote the foreword for this book, he was making the um, revival episodes. I think he was on the second episode. You know, he was getting ready to d- direct an episode of the new X Files. So, you know, here comes this fan being like, you know, write write me a foreword for my book about your show. Um, and uh, and he did, and he did, and uh, you know, it's that's actually one of my favorite parts of the book because I feel like it's it's a love letter from him to the X Files fans, but also to the X Files itself and the journey sort of he's taken in his life with the X-File. So th- that is probably an overlong exploration of, of how that came about. <laughs> and, uh, and you just having said all these very nice things about Chris, I'm going to ruin the moment by asking you, why do you think of all the series that he's, he's produced, he's created, only the X-Files has really worked? For example, uh, I'll give you a second to think about that. I think back to Millennium, which everyone was very excited about at the time, I will never get back the hours that I put into Millennium. Oh, no. I, I feel like I am owed a lot of hours on my life that I should get, kind of like at the end of a soccer game, I should get those bonus minutes uh, wow. uh, back <laughs> to me at the end of life. So if, if if the date of my demise is going to be sometime in 20, 2024, uh, at, you know, 8 p.m. On a, on a Friday, then I think I should get back – Let's see. There were what two and a half seasons? I'm thinking yeah, there were three seasons. Three seasons, sixty something episodes. All right, so I should get sixty hours bonus time. Did uh, you back. watch the whole thing? Yeah, we stayed with it. We tried. And you didn't we, like it? Okay. Just, yeah. Oh my god! It just it just made us go. What the? F- I see. I'm gonna have to rip off my mic and leave the interview now. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. That's I why I let it. you get out the nice things about Chris first before I ask the, um, the bastard question. I I think I I love Millennium. I'm I mean I think uh, it's. It's a brilliantly filmed show. Uh, I love Lance Henriksen in that role. Um, I, I could really go on and give you an artistic defense of the show. I, I, I love the idea of the program about the Yellow House uh, and how the symbol of the Yellow House is used, that it's Frank's way of trying to paint away the darkness. And in the different seasons, the Yellow House represents different things. You know, it's the sanctuary from evil in the first season. Um, it's like Paradise Lost in the second season when he's separated from his wife. It's like Camelot. It's like this lost thing in the third season. I I can tell you my journey with Millennium. When I first watched it, I didn't like it either because I very mistakenly called it Serial Killer of the Week. I went back and I watched it again and I caught up with it. And I started to see that Millennium sort of uses its villains – in the same way that Star Trek uses its planets. You know, you could, you could say, oh, it's Civilization of the Week, different planet every week. You know, Millennium was using, you know, these twisted, you know, people to say things about who we were as people in the 1990s. And it was doing it without the ameliorating humor of like a Mulder or a Scully. So it was a much more grave show. Very dark. Very, very dark. Very dark. It's not something you watch in a lark. But like, I mean, there was one episode that was about like alarm systems, a killer who would like evade alarm systems, and this idea of being in America and we think we're protected because of technology. Like that was sort of one show. There was another show 
like about a gated community where everybody there thought because they had money and lived in the gated community that they were sort of above reproach. But there was a killer there who was like making them see their sin and stuff like that. So the more I delved into the into Millennium, the more I felt it was really deep and it was really brave. I mean – that no, so many shows have tried to imitate it, but like every show that has has only taken a piece of it. It's sort of like you had Frank Black and his investigations, and you had his insight, which some people mistook for psychic abilities. Um, you you had the sort of um, procedural aspect of it, as well as the psychic aspect, and you had like the serial killer aspect. And so the show was canceled after three years. But then you see like the rise of all these shows like, well, Medium, we're just going to take like the psychic angle. Criminal Minds, we're just going to take the serial killer angle. You know, you, you saw like mainstream TV like carved up Millennium and said, no, you can't make a show like this. It's too dark. It's too serious. It's too grave. But what you can do is you can dissect it and make it three shows or six shows. <laughs> so I think it's an enormously influential show. I, you know, I, I'm not here to tell you you're wrong or your impression of it is wrong or to say that mine is right. Uh, I'm just going to tell you that. I loved it. I, I, I loved it and felt it was deep and felt that it was like a really valid and sort of pure alternative to the X-Files. Um, well, the, so, the, okay. only thing, the only thing I would say in response to that is if the creator of that show had not been Chris Carter, who also had the X-Files on the air at the time, I don't think it would have gotten past season one. <laughs> that That may be true. That doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't good, right? I'm, I'm, I won't dispute that with you. Uh, but, okay. But most people watching a show like that, you watch it once and you go, huh? Or you go, oh, that's, you know. And, and I think it had going against it also, and, and I, I, I only bring this up uh, anecdotally, I think the fact that Lance Hendrickson, not the handsomest actor on TV, not a, not a particularly good-looking fella, unlike – uh, you know, Fox Mulder. Let's say, I don't think that helped. That helped it be, you know, like you know. I don't. That's all. That's all. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to pick on it too much because right, right. it's been many years. But I well, mean, but what about the main part yeah. of the question though? Was why do you think that Chris Carter's other shows, following X Files, just never quite made it? And and and, and that goes right up to recently. He was doing a pilot for Amazon, I think. Was it Amazon yeah. or Netflix? And they decided not to even air it. Um, they didn't. I don't think they aired the pilot, or maybe they did. But yeah, the pilot was available. Yes, yeah, it was. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, I loved the pilot. I thought it was great. You know, I going back to Lance Henriksen. I think he was a non-conventional choice, but I thought that was okay. I think he's fascinating to watch. And you know, in a situation like that, a creator like. Chris Carter is sort of in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. If he'd created another show with the sort of structure of the X Files, people have said it's he's ripping himself off. So you, one of the things you do is you don't make it exactly the same. You know, instead of having a young, funny man, you you have somebody who's got a little age and experience on him, and you make that a part of his character, and you make that your central character. So you're not just sort of building off something you've already done. You don't put him in a partner relationship. You know, you, you put him in a marriage, you know, something like that. And, and that, that then becomes part of the, um, the series. So, you know, I think that, you know, he didn't want to repeat himself. You know, it's like, okay, this, this, this time we're going to have, you know, two agents investigating, you know, doomsday cults, you know, and one will believe and one won't, you know, because then of course we say it's too much like the X-Files, you know, he, that he only has one idea, you know, millennium, you know, is evidence that he was trying to think outside, I think, the X-Files box. And in terms of success, you know, you got to ask yourself, why did Rod Serling only really succeed with the Twilight Zone? You know, he had Night Gallery, but, you know, the ratings weren't really good. It lasted about as long as Millennium did. Why did Gene Roddenberry only really have Star Trek? Um, you know, and then later in his life, he had Star Trek The Next Generation. It didn't even make it to a network. It aired. You're in- not giving him credit for, what was it, Earth 2? <laughs> <laughs> for Planet Earth? That's Planet right. Earth, is that what it was? Yeah. And Genesis 2? Yeah, Genesis yeah. Genesis 2, thank oh, no. you. Hey, listen, I loved him. I loved him. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not criticizing those folks. I think they're, you know, brilliant creators, much like um, Chris Carter is. But, you know, some people just aren't going to like what you do. You you know, you, you you come back with a second chance to do something, and you do something that's very grave. You know, Millennium 
sort of inherited the mantle from the X-Files. Originally, the X-Files told some serial killer stories. And, but then it became clear X-Files was moving into sort of the more horror, direct horror terrain and sci-fi. And so Millennium was more like about the monsters inside of us than the monsters outside of us. Like not like the fluke man, but like the creepy people within, you know? And I, I think that that's a hard sell. I think, I think he did it beautifully. But also, you know, I, I, as I like to point out to people, if Millennium were on the air right now getting the ratings it did in 1998, it would be the number one show on TV. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it, 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 it was not at that point. TV was very homogenized. Um, we didn't sort of have all of these – um, other channels like you know Dexter came along and did a lot of what Millennium did and was successful for what seven seasons. But it had a sense of humor. It did have a sense of humor, absolutely. Yeah. But but treading into the dark terrain, the 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 dark inside, the dark passenger, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I think golly. So so if you put Millennium on a station, you know, a premium station, you know, now you know we're we're much more accustomed to that kind of dark side so you could say well maybe chris carter was ahead of his time with millennium uh harsh realm uh you know lasted very few episodes i think only 3 aired before it was even canceled so it's like you can't even argue whether people liked it or not hardly anybody found it yeah. you know right? it was on 3 times you know so so quality kind of doesn't come into it it's like okay no nobody decided to tune in um so you know well, I don't, I don't know. All right, so so now that I've uh, ensured that neither Lance Hendrickson or Chris Carter will ever do the show, um, <laughs> let me ask you this: uh, Do you have any insight, any any expectation of what the new X Files series uh, will be about, and where 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 Carter's going to go with it? Take us. Um, I know I, I know the names of some of the episodes. And I know that they're going to be. It's going to be an, another hybrid. It's going to be a mix of. Um, it's going to be a mix of the, uh, the myth arc and the standalone shows again, the monster of the week shows. So it's going to be true in that sense to the X files legacy. Um, I know that there's a lot of updating because the times have changed, you know, from the 1990s, very different times that we live in now. Uh, a lot of what the X files tread in, in the 1990s was, uh, conspiracies, uh, government conspiracies. The government was doing something, Wrong, you know they were, you know they were putting DNA chips in our vaccines or whatever. You know, if anything, we've become much more paranoid since the 1990s. So I think what you're going to see is a lot more of the modern surveillance state. The idea of government uh, sort of having been licensed after 9/11 to go in and more aggressively at least watch the populace, and you know, with drones and things like that. You know, where could that lead? I, I think that that angle is going to be um, very significant in the new show. I also know, of course, I, what everybody knows that um, if you're a fan of the show, which is that Mulder and Scully are not together when the show begins. And I think I think that's a good decision, um, you know, because things like that happen in life. And we know from Moonlighting that you can't always keep your two main characters uh in love that, you know, interest uh, wanes, you have to put uh, impediments in front of your main character so that they can fight their way back to each other. <laughs> you, you, you bring up Moonlighting. I was thinking of I Dream of Jeannie. But, yeah, same. <laughs> the, the point is still the same. I or Lois and Clark. Right? Lois and Clark, yeah. Sadly. I mean, I was always rooting for – well, never mind. Uh, I was always rooting for Clark to <clears> – <throat> because I wanted to get my hands on uh, Lois. Uh, Terry Hatcher. <laughs> Terry Hatcher. All right, so look, we're going to come back to the X Files for, in, okay. for, for, in, in the final round. I have one or two final questions about the X Files, but we have right. got to talk about this incredible room you are in. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I didn't have any, I didn't have any planned questions about it because I didn't know I was what I was going to see. But uh, uh, we share an interest in a lot of this genre stuff. Yeah. Uh, you've got uh, Star Trek, that's obvious, but right. also behind you, you've got stuff of uh, Space nineteen ninety nine. Which was about the moon colony that uh, uh, it broke away and was sent off into space, uh, kind of a Star Trek Voyager like in a sense. Uh, you've got uh, the black hole, uh, 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 Ernest Borgnine and uh, Roddy McDowell in space, uh, right. Planet of the Apes. Um, just to, let's just take a couple of minutes. Maybe if you want to, maybe you want to grab and point out just a couple of your favorite items behind you. you got it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, 
if you ever watched Space 1999, you know that they got around on these spaceships called um, Eagles. Oh, and look, this I'm showing you my toy. I just came loose a little bit. But up here, this is an eagle from a company called Dinky. <laughs> uh, and the, the central section uh, of the eagle can come out. And, and there's one that also is a magnet so that it can drop uh, – Nuclear, <laughs> it, can, it can pick up uh, radioactive containers. Okay, I live for this stuff. Come on, there. See, see the radioactive containers? Yep, yep. And here's the magnet. There's like a little wheel. You can drop uh, the... the um drop the rope and pick up the magnet, uh, pick up the uh, <laughs> containers with a magnet. So wow. there. Oh, yeah, I know. Nine, I, I lived for 1975. That was a great time. <laughs> <laughs> here is um, a Commander Koenig uh, piggy bank here. See, this is uh, Martin Landau. Oh, that's excellent. And uh, I'm going gra- to grab his uh, wife at the time who co-starred with him. Right. Barbara. That sounds fancy. I'm going to grab his wife. I'm going to grab the <laughs> This was Barbara, uh, Barbara Bain. Bain, right? Barbara Bain, Dr. Helena Russell. And they name. were previously together in Mission Impossible for anyone right. keeping track. Rollin Han and Cinnamon Carter, right? Right. All right. Yeah, I love Mission Impossible as well. Um, let's see what else I have over here. I've got my – I am a huge Planet of the Apes fan. Yep. So I've got uh, my Planet of the Apes lunchbox, which is uh. very – I, I don't take this to work to teach, alas, but I probably should. Can I say I had one of those? Oh. And I took it to school. I mean, I took mine to school. Oh, That's absolutely. how long ago that was. But yeah, I took it to school. And shame on anybody who would say anything bad about Planet of the Apes when I had, when I had a full lunchbox. Boom! Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> I love the Planet of the Apes. I just And, and you know, in that same sort of venue, because it was the 70s, here is your... Uh, Roddy McDowell, uh, piggy bank, uh, oh, cool. as Galen from the Planet of the Apes TV series. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so Excellent. I've got a lot of stuff like this. I wish you could see. Talk about an underrated TV series, Planet of the Apes TV series. I'd, I'd love to see more of that. Oh, I love Planet of the Apes. I, I thought it was too. great. Yep. I, you know, and, and it's so great because, I mean, the show was about racism, right? Mm-hmm. right? You know, as human, as this underclass, you know. Uh, oh, I just great show. Um, now I have a. This was from the first Star Trek movie. It's a toy Enterprise. See, so, yeah, can you can you get a? Yeah, just hold hold very still for a minute. There you go. Oh, uh, let's see there. How's that? Excellent. Yep. We but can... the thing that's unique about this, and forgive me if it falls apart because it's forty years old, <laughs> okay. but I can yank out the nacelles. Now watch, I'm going to break it and make like a new. Um, configuration of Starship from it. Now, I, I, I didn't. This I got at a flea market in like 1999 for 10, 10 bucks, and I was thrilled. If I'd had this in 1979, I would have been absolutely beside myself. Now look at it. Oh, how cool! Yeah, isn't that awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so so there's that. I, I just um, I have tons of stuff like this. Now another one of my favorites. You know, I'm one of those people who's going to defend Star Trek the motion picture too. I, I loved it, um, but. Haven't you always at night just wanted to snuggle up with your own plush Mr. Spock? Oh, I thought you were going to say Uhuru, but okay. I'll play <laughs> yeah. along. Mr. Spock? No, Spock's not your type. How about your very, <laughs> your very own plush Admiral Kirk? Say there. <laughs> yeah, no, I was still hoping again you'd say uh, the Not nurse. even Ilea, not even Persis Combata they didn't make for this. Yeah. <laughs> but you could see her... Now, she's not plush, but there she is. <laughs> there, oh, Lieutenant yeah. Alia. Can you see her? Yep, yep. Okay, let's see. Yeah, there's some back there. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, oh, golly, I've just got so much stuff. You know, I've been collecting this since, literally since I was five years old. And uh, you have, you you'd mentioned to me earlier that you have a nine-year-old? I do. And does I, he want to get at this stuff? How do you handle that? Um... He is a really responsible kid, and we do get out things sometimes. Um, and part of the reason is I'm going to be just brutally honest about this. Two things. Um, I feel like I want to share my joy about this stuff with him, so there's no sense keeping it all in boxes. It's like, oh, no, you can't touch that. Mm. I'd rather he enjoy it. And now he's like out of the blue. Like we watched Deep Space Nine. He's like starting to get into Deep Space Nine. That is so cool. <laughs> He loves Star Trek Deep Space Nine. I was like, I didn't even push that on him. I, I tried to bribe him to watch the original Star Trek with me. Um, 
But there's that, and also, and I'll show you this toy, and you might be able to make it out. Okay. This is a huge eagle that I got for my fifth birthday, or maybe it was my sixth birthday. It was 1976. If you can see this bugger. Wow, that is huge. It, it's huge. And I don't know if you can make it out, but... Can you hold it up just a little bit higher? Yeah. Here we go. That's it. Um, if you can make it out, it's getting yellowed. It doesn't have many usable years left. Uh, it does not. It, it, it's going it, to, you know, it's, it's, so what am I going to be like all precious about it? You know what I'm right, saying? Like, oh, right. yeah, it's so perfect. It's not. The, you, you can see the glue the, when the manufacturers put it together. Yeah. Um, if my son, you know, took an interest in Space 1999 oh, and mean, wanted to You need play, to hang that from the ceiling and fly <laughs> yeah, it. That's right. I've got it down on the floor, but you can see the box for it here. Yeah, There's, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how obsessive I am. I've got the box for it. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Um, All right. Well, let's – go ahead. I'm sorry. I like to share it with my son. For me, that's like that, – that's the thing. I, I want him to share my joy in it. You know, he, there are a lot of things here he's not interested in. We watch Planet of the Apes. I think he's too young for that. Yeah. That wasn't his thing. Um, so he doesn't want to play with those toys. He's getting out of where he likes Star Trek. Um, uh, Space 1999, I haven't been able to bribe him to watch that with me yet, so <laughs> I'll, I'll keep trying. <laughs> all right. Well, that was great. Thank you for that. That was of wonderful. Of course. Thank you. Um, all right. So as we kind of wrap things up, uh, two two very important uh, questions for you about uh, the, the X-Files coming back right. full circle. Uh, do you have any tips for fans who may be thinking about binge-watching the original series uh, in anticipation of its return, are there appropriate uh, uh, drinks or snacks or uh, <laughs> any of that kind of stuff? Um, I have to confess, I like to have a good Merlot in my hand <laughs> while I watch an episode of The X Files. <laughs> I do; it just makes it all the more fun. Um, as far as what to have, um, you know, keep if you have a mini fridge in the room, keep the stuff close because. Um, I love the approach they have. I mean, there's a lot of like throwaway dialogue that you think is th- you think is throwaway dialogue, but it's not. So you need to be focused on on what they're saying. You can't go be making bathroom runs and you know po- microwave popcorn runs because you're going to miss a piece of the puzzle. So you know, get, have have a cooler bag with you. Or, <laughs> you know, don't you know? Have a bucket to go to the bathroom. In. Oh, geez. all right, all right. That, that's a little more information than I need. So okay, let me, let me bring it back then. Uh, last question. Is there an X-Files drinking game that people should know about? Every time Scully says, Mulder, it's me, take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, I don't know how that's – I'm worried about how they're going to do that on the new show with the iPhones because he'll be able to see her name. She'll, she won't have to say, Mulder, it's me, you know, because used to – the old cell phones, you know, they didn't show you well, the – they probably won't even if, – if they're smart, they'll jump ahead and they won't use the, the audio. They'll just go right to video with the phones. Yeah, they could just do FaceTime, I guess, I right? Mean, they, they, you know, they do it on Modern Family so well. They, they've got right. to be able to do it. So you could do that. You could, you know, every mention of Mulder's porn that would be, you know, a good one. Um, every time uh, Skinner flirts with Scully, or you know, there's some suggestion that Skinner and Scully have had a thing together. Right. Right. Uh, that would be one. Um, golly, what else to look for? You know, this isn't really a drinking game, and this part isn't fun. But one of the things that I really like about the X Files is the complexity, and I love the fact that Mulder believes in everything except conventional religion. He'll, like, believe anything, but then you mention, like, Catholicism and Christianity. Like, I don't believe that. And (laughs) Scully will refuse to believe anything, but then you talk about Catholicism, and she's totally on board. I love that nuances of the character. that They they totally flip their personalities when they talk on those subjects. You know, Christianity, you know, they totally flip. Mulder is suddenly deeply skeptical, and and Scully is blinding, you know, faithful i love that so i don't know if you would drink to that but uh, it might be something you know it's like oh wow they've sort of flipped uh personalities whenever religion comes into the picture Very good. i think that's pretty interesting all right well folks listen you can order john kenneth muir's new guide the x-files faq all that's left to know about global conspiracy aliens lazarus species monsters of the week and we'll just throw in Mulder's porn collection <laughs> From great retailers everywhere, or you can get it right now at a great price from MrMedia.com. If you're watching the show on MrMedia.com, below the video, you'll see the cover of the book. You can click on it right now. It'll take you to Amazon. Uh, I believe you can get it in 30 minutes or less via drone in some areas. Uh, uh, If not, uh, you you can have it uh, probably in a day or two. It's available as an e-book, I assume? 
It is. It is now available on Kindle. Absolutely. Okay. So you can have it in seconds downloaded to your uh, e-reading device. Um, John, do you have a, a website? Are you on Twitter, Facebook, any of that kind of stuff? Um, I, am, I am on Twitter at um, J.K. Muir. Um, I'm also on Facebook. Uh, you, and, I, and most of the stuff there I put as public. So you can find me as John Kenneth Muir. I have um, a terrible old – like uh, Yahoo website <laughs> that I don't update. I haven't updated in five years. Um, and that's johnkennethmuir.com. But the deal is if you go there, there's a link to my blog. And I do blog every day, sometimes multiple times a day. So like I've been celebrating the 50th anniversary of Lost in Space uh, this year. I did a James Bond week uh, last week. I've got a Star Wars week coming up on the bus. So so go to my horrible old uh, Geocities uh, website and then – Click the blog, and it has a horrible URL. So, right. <laughs> oh, those were the days, you know. Yeah, they were. absolutely. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, John Kenneth Muir, uh, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I mean that very sincerely. It was a lot of fun, and uh, thank you so much for joining us, in Mr. Media, today. This was a true pleasure. I loved it. recorded live before a studio audience full of guys who didn't make the cut as members of the Lone Gunman in the Noonie Media Capital of the World, St. Petersburg, Florida. Oh, look at this place. <laughs> yeah, this is my home office. This is. Let me tilt it this way. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yes, you're my. <laughs> oh wow, this is great. My place. <laughs> so I, I I love collecting stuff. I've I've collected some of that stuff since I was like five years old, and I'm going to be forty six before too long. So very cool. Some of the plastic is yellowing, right? <laughs> yeah.